Hello, hello everyone. My name is Elise. Welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing so, so good today. I'm very excited because we are finally doing the second episode of my Publisher Taste Test series. I love doing this series, so I'm very happy to be back at it. And as you saw in the title today, we are talking all about and other stories. So this was recommended by the lovely Kedavon from Kedavon Reads. All props go to them. I will link their channel down below. And let's go ahead and dive in. So if you haven't seen one of these before, the format goes a little bit like this. So firstly, we're going to talk about some information about the publisher, history about them, how they got started, the types of books that they publish. After that, we will get into the three books that I will be reading from for this video. I always pick at least one brand new release and then two other books. Those can either be more new releases or backlist books. You'll get reviews for each of those and then we'll have a little wrap up at the end. So that's the down and dirty format of this video. So let's go ahead and get into some information about the publisher. And Other Stories first started in 2010. The idea for this publishing house originally got started in 2009, but they didn't officially open until 2010. And it was started by Stefan Tobler, who was actually a translator prior to that and still a translator. And they wanted to have a publishing entity that was very much dedicated to like new, exciting, more experimental type of fiction that was currently being brought out by the big houses. And Other Stories mainly publishes contemporary fiction. So stuff that has come out in about the last 40 years or so. They do have the occasional nonfiction release though. And a lot of the books that they publish end up being translated as well. I will say in the future, they are going to start releasing poetry. So that will be forthcoming. I'm very excited about that. Anytime more poetry can get published, I'm down for it. So mainly contemporary literature, a lot of times translated and their titles have been very critically regarded and we will get a little bit more into that as we talk about some of the books. So in the very first year that they published, which is 2011, so a year after they got started, they published four books. The very first book that they published was Down the Rabbit Hole. And that to this day is still one of their most read published titles. That one also got shortlisted for the Guardian's First Book Award the year that it came out. So their very first book already got some critical acclaim. So that's great. And over the years, they started increasing just a little bit the amount of books that come out every year. Nowadays, it tends to be around six books each year that get published. And like most other independent or small press publishers, they have a subscription style service. So you can become a subscriber, you receive all of the books that they publish in that given year, and that kind of buy-in allows them to be able to continue running and publishing books. So if you're interested in finding a subscription that works for you, they definitely have one. They all also have something really interesting called reader groups where you can be a part of kind of like book club-esque type groups um, and you can propose certain ones to them and then they will pick the ones that they want to run. So that's very a fun way for a reader to get involved in this publishing house if you feel strongly about it. Uh, this publisher is located in the UK. They were previously located in London, but currently are located in Sheffield. And they did that intentionally because they wanted to try and decentralize the publishing from London. So it didn't seem so posh and like you had to be in London to make it. It's very much now like feeling easygoing with the people type of vibes. And I think that those are the vibes that they're definitely looking for. Let's go ahead and get into the books that I have read before and it's going to be very quick because I have only read one other publication from And Other Stories and that is the ever popular Boulder by Eva Balthazar. This is translated from the Spanish by Julia Sanchez. I should say it's translated from the Catalan and this one is getting increasingly more popular. It was just shortlisted for the International Booker Prize. And that will lead us swiftly into some of their popular releases because Boulder is one of them. I will say I really enjoyed Boulder. I think it's great, highly recommend it, and it's deserving all of the praise that it's getting. 
So Boulder, a very popular release, as I said earlier, Down the Rabbit Hole is still one of their best read books. So that is very popular as well. Other titles you might have heard of, probably due to prize recognition, the recently released Phenotypes by Paolo Scott. This was up for the International Booker Prize last year. And another really big title from them is Wretchedness by Ander Zagtichi. So those are some of their most popular titles if you recognize any of those, or those might also be really good ones to go to if you're looking to try this publisher out. Let's talk about the releases that I am intrigued about. So firstly, the one that I'm intrigued about that I will be reading for this video is Anything That Moves by Jamie Stewart. This is a nonfiction title, so one of those kind of rare nonfictions that they come out with. And this is all about the author's sexual experiences. So I think it's told in 33 small short stories, small stories that are all about a different sexual experience. I think this is supposed to be kind of cringy, occasionally sexy maybe, um, but really just trying to like tell his life through these sexual experiences. So yeah, I'm very intrigued. Can't wait to read this. The other 2023 release that I'm very excited about is Johanna Hedva's Your Love Is Not Good. And this is all about a painter who becomes infatuated with another woman and that other woman becomes their muse and their paintings are really successful. And then they start entering this world where they're starting to have to choose between certain parts of their identity and success or the illusion of success. And they're starting to feel pulled in lots of different directions. I think their obsession with this other woman is also going to spiral out of control. It sounds messy and fun and wonderful. And I also want to shout out that they are coming out with um, a new edition of Split Tooth. So now we are going to quickly go over the three books that I will be reviewing in this video. So as I said earlier, the first one is Anything That Moves by Jamie Stewart. Already described this one, nonfiction, excited. The next one will be Old Lady Voice. This is by Elisa Victoria, and this is translated from the Spanish by Charlotte Whittle. Love this cover as well. I think it's so funny that it's like a old lady wallpaper when it's called Old Lady Voice. And this is about a young girl, I think she's around nine years old, whose mother becomes suddenly ill and can no longer take care of her. So she gets sent off to live with her grandmother and her grandmother kind of has like a no rules household. It seems like she's kind of neglectful of her. Uh, and she starts trying to figure out life with no rules. So I think she has some violent thoughts, some sexual thoughts, and it's her just kind of like running loose out of control, like trying to navigate all the, all the hardships that you have when you're a child, um, but doesn't really have anyone to guide her through that. I do think this is the story where while it's a child narrator, it's really written like they're an adult. I think they have very like philosophical inner monologue that would be very adult-like. So I think that will help ease me into being in a child narrator's mind because I don't typically like that. So I'm very excited about Old Lady Voice. And then the last book that we'll be reading for this video is Permafrost. This is the previous release into English by Eva Baltazar before Boulder, also translated by Julia Sanchez from the Catalan. And this is by a self-proclaimed no bullshit lesbian narrator who I think is just walking around town. She's in Brussels and she's just walking around the city having some philosophical thoughts about modern life. I think that's really all it is. I, I think that it's gonna be kind of darkly comedic and I enjoy that in a narrator. It's also very slim. Um, and if you've read Boulder, it definitely already seems like there's gonna be some similar vibes. So I'm very excited for Permafrost. Can't wait to get into this one. So those are the three books that we'll be reading for this video. I will check back in each time I finish one. And at the end, we'll kind of wrap up and talk about the publisher overall. Okay. Okay. Listen, this is not the update that I came here wanting to do. But nevertheless, here we are. 
I'm going to rip the bandaid off. This is a DNF for me. Now, I normally don't show the books that I DNF in videos only when they're in like set TBR videos. So I've already talked about them. And I went back and forth on this a lot, but I'm going to leave this in because the intent of the video is to try out publishers, try and understand why a certain publisher would publish this book based on the information that I have of them. And even if a book was not for me, I think that that can still exist in a way that doesn't feel like I'm just bashing on this book. So let's try it out. Um, but yeah, this is a DNF for me. I got, let's see, I got 65 pages in, so that far in. And I actually, I thought about DNFing it multiple times leading up to page 65 and was trying to push through because I knew I was reading it for this video. And then I just kept reading like one more story and was like, I can't do this to myself. So like I've said previously, this is nonfiction. It's about Jamie Stewart's life. And it's specifically told in 33, I think like sexual escapades that they have had in the past that are sort of mapping out the story of their life. That's the premise. And I know e even in the blurb, it said that like, these aren't always meant to be like sexy like a lot of them are cringy and stuff like that so I was ready for that but honestly this is so traumatic like it's one of if not the most traumatic books that I have ever read and I just could not keep subjecting myself to how horrible all of the stories are and I know that these are real I don't want to take away from that but this like was a level for me that was I wasn't going to get anything out of it. I was starting to feel kind of icky reading it. It almost felt like because I wasn't getting anything out of it and I, that's not to say that no one else will that it felt like some weird type of exploitation like I was reading all of these horribly traumatic experiences about someone um, and not for the purpose of like gleaning knowledge or looking at growth or like anything not that everything has to be about growth but like I just there was nothing for me to be had about this I felt very uh unethical reading it so I'll say that well I do think that this book will be for a certain group of people I just think that this is a very niche book and you should really go into it with eyes wide open I don't think this was marketed correctly Again, I know the blurb says that like some of it is cringeworthy, but like it is traumatic, like capital T trauma from the get go. Part of what I wasn't working with here is it seems like they really have no remorse for some of the things that they have done. So I read, I don't know, six or seven stories at least, maybe more than that because they're really short each story. So probably more like around 10 stories. And it's just about them hurting other people and other people hurting them, in my opinion. And I know I only read part of it and I actually read the last story because I was trying to look through interviews to see if, if there would be some sort of arc um, and like some, some self-awareness and accountability and, and stuff like that. And some people were saying the last story got a little bit of it. I read it. Eh. I, I didn't get that vibe. So I think if people could see themselves in this, potentially it could be really normalizing for them and that could be a good thing. Um, I think if maybe people have felt some shame around traumatic things happening, um, this might be a, a good fit for them. Again, I would really look up trigger warnings for everything going in. The last story I read that was just like the final straw for me where I was like, I just can't do it. It's like he's exploiting this person in Thailand and doesn't really seem to have any remorse about it. They'll say like, I know this is bad, but like I would still feel this way today. And like, like that's almost verbatim like some of what they say in here. And I just couldn't, it did not feel good for me to read. So I'm not going to read it. It's not for me. That's okay. Um, this is already a longer clip than I intended it to be. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure what else to say about this other than just be careful going into it. 
know that it's very traumatic. And honestly, like this made me think like, I haven't read A Little Life, but for the people who are like, oh, A Little Life, like that could never happen. Nothing could be that traumatic. Uh, uh, this, this is nonfiction. And while I know I haven't read A Little Life, I promise you this is more traumatic than A Little Life. Like my God, my God. As far as and other stories publishing this, I can see how this would fit under their publishing brand and kind of like strategy of the types of books that they want to publish. And this is the type of book that only a small publisher could publish, right? Like no big house is ever going to get away with this. You can be much more experimental when you're a small independent press. And I definitely think that's what And Other Stories is doing here. Again, this is a niche book. I think it will really work for a small amount of people. And that's a great way for a small indie publisher to release books is these more niche, very experimental books that certain people will love and certain people will not. So I definitely can see why And Other Stories publish this. It's just not for me and I would warn other people to thoroughly check out all of the warnings before they get into this. So that is Anything That Moves. We're going to put that one to bed. Please let me know if you have read this in the comments down below what you thought about it. I definitely want to chat to some people about it. Um, but with that, here's hoping that the next book I pick up will be a little bit more for me. So I will see you when I finish the next one. Bye. All right, we are back, people. I have finally read the next book for this video, and that is Old Lady Voice. This is by Elisa Victoria, and it's translated from the Spanish by Charlotte Whittle. And I thought I was going to read Permafrost as the second book, but no, I did not. I read Old Lady Voice first. And let me first give you the premise, and then we'll get into my review of this book. So this book follows a nine-year-old narrator named Marina, and she is trying to come to grips with where she belongs in the world, who she is as a person. It's very much a coming-of-age tale. And the main part of the plot for this novel, which is very little, by the way, is that her mother is ill with some unknown illness, and she, Marina then has to stay in love with her grandmother for a while, while her mother is getting some type of treatment and she's unclear of what's going to happen to her mother and therefore what's going to happen to her. That is the blurb that I would give. The first thing that I, I think I need to address about this is I don't think the blurb necessarily is 100% accurate to what you're getting in here and that's okay that can often happen but it did mean that I need to shift my expectation a little bit. So let me tell you the part about the blurb that I don't think is totally accurate or really doesn't take up much of the story is the very first part of the blurb. And that's also why I have a little bit more of a problem with it because it's the first thing you read about the story. And it talks about how Marina's mother is ill. And it says that she's living with her grandmother and waiting to see if she's going to have to be sent to a convent or not. That is a very small portion of the book. It's rare that Marina is actually actively thinking that type of thought. I think she's definitely wondering what's going to happen with her mother. But this idea about like potentially being sent off to a convent is very, very small. It basically just takes place in her doing catechism and getting baptized in case she ends up going to a convent school, but there's no like direct correlation. That is like an active thought at the forefront of her mind. So that's the part of the blurb I take a little bit of issue with. Now, the last half of the blurb I think is 100% accurate and it really speaks to the voice and how character driven this novel is because it says that Marina is a nine year old who can swear like a sailor, but think like a novelist. And I think that is a great description for this character that we are following. Um, she is very, profound in some ways, has an acute way of analyzing the world and the people around her and putting words to the things that they themselves cannot even say. It kind of has that like blunt wryness that children can sometimes have but notch it up in terms of emotional intelligence by like 10. So in some ways you do need to suspend your disbelief 
in order to get over that. It is not an average nine-year-old by any means in that sense, but there are a lot of childlike qualities to her as well. So that was fine with me. I'm okay with suspending my disbelief to that degree, but just know that if that's something that bothers you, she is an above average nine-year-old for the sake of the story. Now let's talk about a few of the things that I really enjoyed because there were a number of things that I enjoyed about this, a number of things that I didn't enjoy, and then some things that I thought were just fine. So overall, a uh, kind of middle of the road book for me, I definitely would still recommend it and think that there could be a really good audience for this. So hopefully my description and review will give you an idea of whether or not this could be for you. So the things that I loved about this novel, I think firstly, it's just the character of Marina, the youngest one, I should say herself. She's very richly drawn. She has a really excellent voice um, that comes alive. I had no problem kind of envisioning who she was or understanding her motivations, things like that. Um, very well drawn character overall. One of my favorite things about this novel, in fact, maybe the favorite thing about this novel, was the connection of the lineage between the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter. So all of them are named Marina, and obviously that's intentional. And for me, I read that as this way to see this line of women who are a collection, like a whole, and you could even, I think, see them as reincarnations of one another or in different stages of the same life. Like they are one person, you're getting to see them as a grandmother, as a mother, and as a daughter. At least that's how I interpreted some of it and I liked having that lens and reading of it. And you can see this by some of the similarities that are between the three of them at these different stages of life that are informing the way that they think and the way that they act and interact with one another. So they are all very blunt characters, not afraid to speak their mind. Um, while the youngest Marina is definitely working on formulating some thoughts and, and how she communicates those things, she's having very blunt, wry observations about the people around her and what she sees going on. All of them also engage in confrontation throughout the novel, definitely in different ways. They're all very opinionated, and I think that's a good through line between all of them. And then they also all wrestle with desire in their own way, which is another big theme in this novel is desire. They definitely know what they're attracted to and that they feel desire in general, and you can really see that in youngest Marina's thoughts and the older two Marina's kind of like actions and words. So I loved all of those three lines. I liked that they shared the same name and you can even envision them as like three different developmental stages of the same person. The other thing that I really liked this about this was the layering of certain description or even themes that were coming up. And I think the theme that this most comes up for is gender within the novel. The youngest Marina is really subverting a lot of the gender norms that maybe would typically be thrown on a young girl. For example, she, she has a lot of desire. Her desire can sometimes be linked to violent and grotesque things. Um, she's very aware and hyper fixated on desire in some circumstances. I, I think those are all a little bit subversive and I liked that. So that's kind of one layer that's happening up top. You're getting to see the inner monologue that the youngest Marina is having around desire um, and that's kind of the most overt layer. Then there's this secondary layer that starts happening about halfway through the novel when she starts explicitly saying that she could see herself wanting to be a boy or understanding how much easier life might be for her if she was a boy. So that's like a, another layer that starts getting built on throughout the novel. And then there's this third layer, maybe the most implicit layer that's happening through here that starts from the very beginning. And that is her relationship with her mother's boyfriend. And it's a very unique relationship in a lot of ways. And I think it's important to have him as a character, like a foil for all of the women in here. And Marina has a kinship with him 
and even the way that they interact with each other, they call each other their partners. And I think that this is a clever way to show the ways that Marina, the youngest Marina, really can identify as masculine and identify as a boy. And some of these thoughts for her come from the relationship with her mom's boyfriend. For example, the like dirty comic books that she's very much invested in are ones that she steals from him. So those types of things she's definitely inheriting and also resonating with with his character and I think that that is another layer that is very richly drawn to have this conversation about gender for the youngest Marina. And I really thought that was smart storytelling to interweave it in so many different ways. So when you are getting maybe some of the more explicit conversations at the end about her just thinking it would be easier to be a guy and sort of wanting to transition more into her like masculine identity through clothing and other things, you wholly believe it. And it doesn't feel like the book is just telling you all of a sudden that this transition is happening. It has been guiding you to that point the entire time. And I think, again, so smart. That's really impressive on the writer to do. It feels like this idea of showing not telling that I think people really resonate with and thought it really added to the character as well. Now let's get into some of the things that I didn't like. The first thing, and maybe the most important thing, is I don't think this warranted the page length. This is just about 300 pages and it could have been much shorter. There was not anything that was propulsive enough to want to continue reading it, honestly. Every time I put it down, I wasn't super driven to pick it back up. It took me almost a full month to read, which is really rare for me. That's the first gripe I have with this. The second gripe I have with this is a minor structural thing. So this is broken up into three parts. I don't know if they're called books or what, um, but it's broken up into three parts and I thought that was wholly unnecessary. The parts didn't really distinguish much for me. I wasn't sure why they were there. So it just was like mildly confusing to me that it was like book one, two, three. Cause I was like, why? I didn't get that. I think that could be taken out. And then I think the last thing about this is there are parts where I felt confused for, especially around her age. So there are at least a flashback and a flash forward. I don't know if there were more and they weren't even like easily distinguishable. There were just parts where all of a sudden she would like have a thought or say that she was four. And then there was a part where she had a thought or said that she was 11. Um, but it was, I don't know, very fever dreamy. I don't know if that was intentional. And I think that's part of why I don't like it. It's like, I don't know if it was intentional or not. It just felt confusing to me. So maybe I'm not getting something there, but I, I want to be able to get it, whatever's happening. So I didn't like that either. But yeah, overall, I thought this was a very interesting book to read. Clearly, I had a lot to say about it. And hopefully based on that, you can determine if this would be a good pick for you or not. I can definitely see why this would get published though. And I think the writer is really smart. So I'll definitely be on the lookout for something she does in the future if I feel like the premise of the book is more in line with something that would resonate with me. So that is Old Lady Voice. And I didn't even talk about the title, but that's a whole other thing I'm not gonna get into at this point. So Old Lady Voice stunning cover. Happy I finally finished it up and next we will be on to permafrost. So I'll see you when I'm done with that one. Bye. All right, welcome to the year 2024. It has been a while since I've updated this video, but I have finally read permafrost by Eva Balthazar. This one is translated by Julia Sanchez and I have been on a journey with this book. So I started this so many months ago, like at least six months ago, if not more, and was really struggling with it. I read about the first like 40 pages and had to put it down. I wanted to come back to it because I wasn't sure if I just wasn't in the right headspace for it. The main character is pretty, I don't know, snarky, pessimistic, lots of different things that we'll get into, but I'm so grateful that I came back to it 
and set it down for a while because I really enjoyed this book. It, I was not expecting that going into the reread or going into starting it over, but I really, really liked it and I'm so happy. I think that I might enjoy this even more than Boulder, which I also really liked. I'm not sure if that's a little bit of recency bias, but yes, let me tell you more about this. So we are following an unnamed narrator, I think, and I will say there's a lot of content warnings in this. She frequently talks about suicide. That is very repetitively brought up in a number of different ways, like ideation, intent, attempts, uh, lots of stuff happening here around suicide. And it's also talking about the body, like the physicalness of our bodies and how that can be like kind of a, a nightmare and a delight and the contradictions that our bodies bring really, really fascinating stuff. This is very stream of consciousness like it's lots of little like vin vignettes and snippets. It's not in cr chronological order, um, but it's really not confusing. You are able to see the through line. And I just got into a really good rhythm with the narrator's voice. So again, there's not really like a lot of plot to talk about. There's stuff in here about her relationship with her sister. Her sister is very different from her, not just in like values and interests, but also in what they want out of life. And there's a, a reckoning of that in a lot of ways. There's a lot of explicit sex in this. So know that going in. The In the back, the blurb that kind of like pulled me into this was saying that the narrator is a no bullshit lesbian. And she very much is that. So she has lots of lovers to varying different degrees of success and pleasure. Really fascinating to be in this character's mind. Really sad in a lot of ways to be in this character's mind. Um, but somehow she manages to keep things like wry. So they, they have this kind of like dark humor type of tone to it. So even though it's really heavy subject matter, you don't feel totally bogged down, maybe as much as you might expect knowing what the content of this is. I, I think I did like this more than Boulder. You can definitely see how this is like a loose trilogy, like a triptych in a way, because the narrator in Boulder has a lot of similarities. They're definitely different from one another, but there are lots of similarities. And even though I think Boulder might be the more accessible one in terms of plot and themes, like it's more um, straightforward, I guess, I think this one is so fantastic and would highly encourage people to read it if they did like Boulder. But just know that it's like not as plotty as that one. Um, and, and Boulder wasn't that plotty anyway, but it definitely has more than this. So yeah, I'm so happy to be able to wrap up this taste test on a, a great note because this was probably the book I enjoyed the most from the video. And it has really been a joy to read these three and other stories books. So here they are all together. And I do think that, you know, and other stories says they're unapologetically literary. And I do think it really shows in these books that I read. These were off the wall, like not inherently likable in a lot of ways. All of the kind of characters in the two novels were crass and I think it's very experimental between the three of them which is really like the joy of a small press or an indie publisher that they get to take a lot of risks and these are not going to be for everyone but there's so much great content in all of these books and I think that people could really get a lot and be challenged by these books. So really appreciated getting to read these three and spend a little more time in a certain publisher. And I'm really excited to pick up Mammoth, which is going to be the third book in the triptych by Eva Balthazar that comes out in August, I think, of this year. And can't wait for that. I will definitely read from this author again. I know this wasn't a huge win for me, but I'm sure that this will reach its readers 
and yeah, I had a great time reading these. So hopefully you enjoyed. If you have any and other stories books that you absolutely love, please put them down below and put them on my radar and I will see you all in a video very soon. Bye.